proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magus, the more, the better. Hello, everybody. Today is Saturday, April 28, 2018. And I am gathered here with Jörg Lissmann and Michael from Germany. And we are going to read and discuss the next reading here in this chapter 40 of Code Word Barbalon. We're on page 399. And the title of this chapter is Knights Templarism, Masonry, and the Youth of Demolay. Now we're on the subchapter title of the Masonic Youth of Demolay. Welcome, Yerk and Michael, both. Thanks for the invitation, Brett. And uh, let's see that we can have a fruitful Sabbath afternoon, in my case, Sabbath morning in your case over there. And that we read a little bit about uh, this Masonic organization that the Order of de Molay probably is, as we're going to read in the very first sentences. But first, of course, let Michael say hello here. Yes, hello, guys. Uh, nice to talk with you again. I try to follow you back on track, and I'm uh, very keen on learning more about the Masonic youth. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us, Michael. We'll look forward to getting on with the study here. It's, it's pretty deep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not a shallow one, that's for sure, I would say, Jörg. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, as far as I remember, the last reading was quite interesting compared to the ones before that were very very dark let's say oh, yes. um, i appreciate the last one that we did uh, much more mm -hmm. and i hope that the book will continue in this kind of tone because i don't like too much of this darkness that um, seems to overshadow even my spirit sometimes and i don't like that i don't appreciate that well you know it's interesting mm. if you don't mind me <laughs> making a comment is is you know my perspective here from america is that in great britain that place has really undergone a lot of torment. I mean, those, uh, I really have never traveled to Great Britain. I've never visited, so I have no idea. You know, what the place reality. are you talking of? Well, just, you know, London, wherever. Oh, you, mean, you, mean, you mean the UK altogether yeah, in general? Yeah, UK in general. Yeah, right. Mm. It's got to be a, a very um, different place than here <laughs> yeah, i was Certainly. i was over there in the uk two times as far as i remember yeah the first time was in 1978 to learn a little bit of the language i was there because i was very bad in english mm. and then i, I spent there a fortnight uh, uh, as a guest in a family a, a a older woman with her younger daughter mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> I and my friend of school, we, we stayed over there at her, at her house. And in the morning, we had school. In the afternoon, we had time off. And in that time, I was, uh, quote, unquote, addicted to punk. 
punk music, 1978. <laughs> ah, sex uh, pistols. We, we That'd even, be a good place there. We even we even visited in Wembley Hall the last uh, concert of Shame 69, okay. a punk group at that time. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, and I was of course in Kings Road and uh, buying all these buttons. At, at that time, it was modern <laughs> to have buttons on your clothes. You know. Yeah. yeah. That make a statement like "fuck you" and "piss off" and all this, <laughs> all this garbage. And I had and I and I wear yeah, those. That's punk, I, all right. I, yeah, and I, <laughs> I, 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 I wore those when I left the country and when I went through customs. There was a woman who said, "No, you're not allowed to wear that," and took them all away from me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm only twelve years old. What are you gonna do? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And another time was a few years later. I think I was fifteen or sixteen, and I spent a fortnight in Bournemouth. That's in the south of England. Uh, quite nice. There has palm trees and uh, ta- palm trees and everything. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say that uh, England or the United Kingdom is more uh, Masonic or, or, or worse country than, for example, the United States of America, mm-hmm. or or even here on the continent. Because um, here on the continent, we have steeped in Romanism. When you look at our old buildings, you can see Romanism all over. You know and mm-hmm. uh, Probably, probably even more, as in the United States of America. But even there, when you go through Washington uh, or through the oldest streets of New York on these cities, or like Boston or or whatever, I think you you have these old buildings, and they are all Roman, right? Right. So, yeah, you yeah. have that everywhere. It is here in Germany. In Germany, there are several museums. There are so many museums, and uh, where, which you can visit uh, also on the outside. There's a very famous uh, area where they have uh, built up uh, half of a Colosseum even. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me now start here in uh, page 399, the Masonic Youth of Demolay. And as always, brothers, when you have a comment, you just interrupt me with comment or question or, hey, Jörg, slow down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I need to ask a question. Sure. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. The Order of Demolay is a Masonic youth organization and a movement of international scale with 1,000 chapters worldwide. Demolay was founded as a charity in 1919 in Kansas City, Missouri, by Frank S. Land. Mr. Land was, of course, a Freemason and was selected to act as the director of a Masonic Relief and Employment Bureau of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Land and his quote-unquote superiors decided to create a youth arm of masonry, and he based his new order after that of the dead grandmaster of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay. He lived between 1244 and 1314 and was born in Vitry, France. At the age of 21, he joined the order of the Knights Templar, eventually rising to become its grandmaster. In 1314, he was burned at the stake, partly to destroy the order's increasing power and partly for having confessed to committing acts of gross sexual incidences. It was also alleged that the Templars were worshippers of an idol called Baphomet, whose rituals involved sex, magic, and spiritistic illumination. The Templars were charged with practicing authorized and unnatural vice, sodomy and pedophilia. Yet, it is after this order's leader, Jacques de Molay, that the modern youth order of de Molay derives its name. That's fitting for a pedophile organization, right? A rather sick choice, like naming a safe house for battered woman Ted Bundy, seeing that Jacques de Molay was a seducer of boys, as Bundy was a fatal abuser of young women. No wonder there is an epidemic of pedophilia in America. Uh, not only in America. No, not only in America, but throughout the whole Roman Catholic Church, which is mm. all over the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and don't us don't let us even get started to mention the uh, worldwide pedophile agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. But then we are not even done by tomorrow when we speak about that. The official De Molay website states, quote, De Molay is a Masonic youth organization for young men between the ages of 12 and 21. 
De Molay is nothing more than a state-level feeder organization for the worldwide recruiting of youths into the ranks of Freemasonry and Knights Templarism, a nursery to the Masonic Templar system. Indeed, many distinguished Masonic organizations endorse De Molay, including the General Grand Chapter of Royal Arch Masons, the Grand Lodges, the Shriners, etc. De Molay is today regarded by Masonic organizations as a, quote, devoted champion of Freemasonry and of its teachings, unquote, and its founder, Frank Sherman Land, would himself, quote, become a figure of international prominence within Masonry, eventually becoming imperial potentate of the shrine, mean the shriners of North America, from 1945 through 1955. Counted among his friends, U.S. congressmen, state governors, movie and radio stars, military leaders, leaders of industry, presidents of the United States of America, and a veritable legion of young men in their teens, unquote. So I don't think that it is um, very assumptuous to say that this Demolay organization also has connections to Bohemian Grove, after what we all read here. De Molay's alumni include Walt Disney, John Wayne, Walter Cronkite, Football Hall of Famer Fran Tarkenton, and President Bill Clinton, who was a master counselor of De Molay. In 1987, Clinton, then a senior De Molay, was chosen by Scottish Rite Freemasonry as the motto states, quote, No De Molay shall fail as a citizen, as a leader and as a man, unquote. Bill Clinton certainly proved it. He certainly proved that he is not a failure. That is the power of the continuing influence of the Templars, even to this day, whose existence has been acknowledged by the BBC. And in Rulers of Evil, of course, we read that the Jesuits are the revived Templars. Now, the author Nestia, Nesta Williams, uh, sorry, the author Nesta Webster, comments on the importance of, the organ of organizations such as de Molay in the overall strategy of the Jesuit-controlled Masonic societies. Quote, It does not matter what the ends may be, whether political, social, or religious, the system remains the same. The setting in motion of a vast number of people and making them work in a cause unknown to them. As regards that... <clears throat> as regards that other youth organization called the Boy Scouts, like Lady Queensborough. Quote, we refrain here from going too closely into the subject of the Boy and Girl Scouts moving, leaving it as a suggestion that, at, that parents, guardians and teachers of youth would do well to investigate the Judeo-Masonic allegiance of scout leaders and masters. Unquote. As Lady Queensborough reminded us, quote, those who rule Freemasonry today rule the world, unquote. And this ends the chapter of Knights Templarism, Masonry, and the youth of De Molay. And there we learn that the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts movement is actually an enterport into the Masonic organization of De Molay's youth, as I probably understand this correctly. Don't I? Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so. So that's the same like when you have the Rotary Club, which is an entry level to Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. It is always the way how they disguise it. And it is always to keep in mind that you have a secret agenda and you have an open agenda. You have a secret teaching and you have an open teaching. And that is with Boy Scout, nothing else as it is with the Rotaries, it seems to be. Now we turn to Chapter 41, Masonic Rites and Symbols, the GAOTU and His Magnetism. Uh, GAOTU, what does that stand for? Is that the great... Uh, uh, no idea, maybe we'll find out here. On oh, the next, great architect on, on the of next the universe. Page. Great, yeah. Uh, yeah, great architect yeah. of the of the universe. That's yeah. the one that I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, right. Great architect. Yeah, 
So, of course, everybody who is not very familiar with these kind of terms expects that when you speak of the great architect of the universe, that you just speak of the God of the Bible. That is a very, very big mistake. Mm-hmm. So, Masonic rites and symbols, the great architect of the universe and his magnetism. Can I, can I, add, can I add something? Sure. Uh, uh, you know what reminds me of the great architect is the movie Matrix. Hmm. Because, because the creator of the Matrix is called the architect there. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. just to add up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. The Matrix has a very symbolic meaning also uh, when you, when you uh, compare it to the Bible. Um, this Neo, he is the one uh, and we are all to be, be made one, right? Mm-hmm. There's so much symbolism in it. Uh, on that, we could spend a whole day and, and, and do another video on that. But yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's correct. When you say that um, that's the architect, you are absolutely correct. It's, it's like you can also compare that when you watch the Truman Show, um, where, this, uh, where this guy uh, on the top, uh, is also the architect of that whole show and, and, and leads mm-hmm. Truman through all his life, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, and he is playing God even in that series, I mean, uh, in, that, in that movie. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there are, I think, I, I think a lot of movies that refer to that. I think he also re- is referred to there as the architect of the show, so mm-hmm. also made, made God-like. But we have just have to understand that the great architect of the universe is not the God of the Bible who created it all, is not the God who called himself I am, and mm. is not his son, Jesus Christ, who created it all in the name of the Father. Okay? So it starts here with a quote from Montaigne, essays, Nothing is so firmly believed as what is least understood. Unquote. Well, you can pin this to the evolution theory, eh? Mm. Because how can you understand something that is not even proven in one little simple piece, but it is so firmly believed, even though people understand it the least what it's all about. Another quote from Albert Pike in Morals and Dogmas reads, but masonry still survives vigorous and strong, as when philosophy was taught in the occult, or Gnostic schools of Alexandria, unquote. Yeah, the Gnostic schools of Alexandria. I am very deep into the study of those for the moment because I read in German this book, uh, The Bible. Is it correct or is it corrupt? Um, it's it's not a book. It's a paper, PDF paper of 43 pages by uh, Rudolf Ebertshäuser. Very interesting, and I don't need to remind uh, English-speaking uh, people of those things because they have, of course, uh, from Gail Ripplinger, New Age Bible versions mm. and uh, and other books and uh, like uh, did the Roman Catholic Church give us the Bible that I read from Czech publications on my channel on the same subject, but in German there is a very 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 hard to find anyone who speaks the truth about the forgerized Bibles, you know, and uh, what was the point that I wanted to make? Well, the school of Alexandria, because there of course we see the two streams of where the Bible texts come from. And there we see that you have one correct stream that comes from Antioch, which is the Byzantine text, which is, as we call it today, the Textus Receptus, the received text. And you have the other stream that is from Alexandria that gives us the corrupted versions, like the uh, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, the Codex Vaticanus, and of course also the Septuagint is to be counted in there. And Every time when I read about Gnostic schools of Alexandria, I just can't help to think of this and how they corrupt our Bibles that we have, our Word of God. And again, we didn't make the point up to now. I'm going to make the point right here, right now. This is the most important book ever for you to hold in your hand when you are a native English speaker, the King James Version of 1611, to have the real truth in your hand And by that you are able, when you understand that book, when you believe that book, and when you read that book, and when the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth, as Jesus promised us, you have the chance to discover all the lies in the world that are spread on all of us. 
Okay, so I'm going to start reading now. We're on page 402. And uh, I saw already when we go into this chapter that there are, uh, is that here or is that in the next chapter? Oh, no, it's not here about the tables and, and, and pictures and all that stuff. No, it's, it's not here. Okay, we can continue. How ridiculous, the author continues, the argument put forward by some writers that Freemasonry is, a purely, a, uh, is purely a charitable institution. Equally facile is the view that regards the Masonic rites as no more meaningful than that of a type of meaningless, but as symbolic rituals, much like saluting the flag or swearing someone into a public office. Unquote. On the contrary, as Stanley J. Bensgrove, Bensgrove observed at a presentation to the California College of the Societas Rosicruciana, Rosicrucian organization is that, in civil, uh, Civitatibus Föderatis, quote, while the social and fraternal aspects of Freemasonry are well known, there are esoteric and hidden levels as well, unquote. Yeah, the esoteric is always the hidden and the exoteric is the out in the open. Mm -hmm. Now we may put it even more bluntly than that. Freemasonry is a giant evil and far more occult than many realize. No, let us not mince our words here. Freemasonry is a ghastly deception, a grim joke, and the author of that joke is not God, but his enemy. This entity, the Masons call GAOTU, Great Architect of the Universe, their parody of Yahweh. This, dear reader, is the sober truth. May this chapter end forever the much vaunted claim and oft repeated fable of the benign, charitable nature of Freemasonry. This great and almost impenetrable hoax, which Freemasonry is. We will see shortly that Freemasonry is no quote unquote square deal. Now, the origin of Masonry it's the symbols and rituals. The Gnostic secrets, Gnostic is meaning wisdom, it comes from the Greek word, by the way for the people who do not know this, because knowledge is what Gnostic is translated about. So this is the known secrets or the knowledge secrets of the Masonic traditions come from the Arabs via the Knights Templars, who got theirs from the Babylonians by way of the Persians. The illusion Gnostic rites and the rituals associated with them are found today in the higher degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry an intensely occult order. The rites are also consistent with the inner core of the Roman Catholic doctrine. I will justify this latter assertion in due course. Suffice to say here that Professor Robeson confirms the first two assertions. Quote, the true secrets of Masonry, which had always been in that order, having been acquired by the Knights during their services in the East, from the pilgrims whom they occasionally protected or delivered, every true mason is a knight templar. Unquote. Jesuitism is a mere variation on knight's templarism, although far more odious in character. And true Catholicism is Jesuitism. We shall now see why. I even dare to say when it says Catholicism is Jesuitism, Catholicism is Judaism. Hmm. Because the hmm. Jewish leaders at the time were as betraying as the Roman Catholic Church is today. Mm -hmm. And they still work hand in hand together. Mm -hmm. But absolutely true Catholicism is Jesuitism. It is built on two very strong pillars. That is the Council of Nicaea in 325, and that is first and foremost the Council of Trent between 1545 and 1563. There, Jesuitism really was established, 
and you cannot speak of Jesuitism without Catholicism, and you cannot speak of Catholicism without Jesuitism. And those two councils, especially the last one, the Council of Trent, is the reason why. Now the author continues, there exists a set of documents now known collectively as the old charges, according to which Freemasonry is declared to be an, quote, ancient and honorable institution, unquote. In another Masonic source, we are told that Masonry is, quote, a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, unquote. Ancient, no doubt, it is. Veiled in symbols and allegory, that too is true. But an honorable institution? A system of morality? <laughs> Certainly not. These eulogies are not justified by the sober facts. To explain the reason for so asserting, we again turn to the book Morals and Dogma, the Masonic Bible for the higher degrees. The book's full title is Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Morals and Dogma is a book of esoteric, occult philosophy written by Albert Pike, the celebrated 19th century Grand Pontiff General of Masonry. The work was first published in 1871 by the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree Scottish Rite for the Southern Jurisdiction in the United States of America. There have been several subsequent editions of Morals and Dogma, the original version being now out of print. It has 861 pages of text and 218 pages of index and is over two inches thick. It discusses the philosophical, the philosoph philosophical symbolism of each of the degrees of Freemasonry in painfully exhaustive detail. In the older editions of the book, the title page states in large, bold letters, quote, esoteric book, for Scottish right use only to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient, unquote. Clearly, the original edition of the book was not for public consumption. Here, most Masons have never even heard of the book, never mind read it, as it was traditionally given to the candidate only upon his receipt of the 14th degree of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Apparently, this practice was stopped in 1974. The book has not been given to, can to a candidate since 1974, that means. Another book, A Bridge to Light by Rex R. Hutchins, is instead provided to candidates today. There are now two versions of Morals and Dogma, distinctly different to the original manuscript published in 1871. The reasons for the change and deletions in the newer versions will soon become apparent in the details that follow. Now, before I continue here, I have uploaded a book reading that is called Behind the Dictators, which Brett uh, has uploaded on his channel too. By the time you see this video, he will have completed the whole reading. And there also, uh, in, in one of the uh, Parts. I think it is in the chapter called The Strange Case of Leo Texel. I speak of Albert Pike and I speak of the deception on page 211 where it states that, um, or where it, where it allegedly states that uh, Freemasonry is Luciferian and that Lucifer is the god of Freemasonry. And the PDF version of the book Morals and Dogma that I possess, that is here on my computer, um, absolutely does uh, show that that quote that was there from Leo Texel taken out of the book, uh, page 201 or 211, don't pin me on that now, um, that that quote is not to be found in the book, at least not in the book that I have here. And therefore, of course, it was another part in or another uh, interesting uh, knowledge to get from the book Behind the Dictators, that Leo Texel was a deceiver working for the Jesuits on the one time, uh, meaning working for the Catholic Church on the one time and working for Freemasons on the other time. But as we know, the Jesuits control always both sides. So I think this Leo Texel 
was most and for all used to discredit the, at that time, becoming knowledge of what Freemasonry is all about. Whether now it was correct that Albert Pike states, states that in his book, Morals and Dogma, I cannot say, because I don't have an original of Morals and Dogma here. Probably will I never ever have one, because I'm not a Freemason, and this is not even given out to Freemasons anymore. But I just wanted to say, with the means that I had at that time, and uh, behind the dictators, I said with conviction that this very well-known quote that you can find all over the internet, that is uh, acquitted to uh, uh, Morals and Dogma and Albert Pike, is a lie. Because in my book that I have here, it is not in it. And of course, it makes sense when you understand who Leo Texel was. So I'm sorry I had to go into this uh, for you two guys. I don't know if you have any, uh, if you have seen that and, and any knowledge of what I'm speaking about here, but I think it is very important that, uh, as the author says here, that that book is even not given to the people anymore now, and um, they, they give another book, and that, of course, uh, there are editions and editions, and the, the book has been edited in the meantime too. So I don't know how reliable that PDF is that I have on my, com on my computer, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. When I was doing some book research for you, Jörg, uh, some months ago, trying to find a German original copy of this, uh, of this writing of Martin Luther, I mm -hmm. visited a library that actually had a physical copy of Morals and Dogma that I saw in their, in their archive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when we were talking with Tom in a Bible study once, he says, why would they have that? And, you know, that always stuck with me. It's like, yeah, why would they have that? Good question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Yeah, just, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, you know, it's fine to research these things, but we've got to be really careful with confusion. Don't confuse yourself. Um, when you get into studying this stuff, you got to take your time and be careful because you can fall into pitfalls here and get misled and start thinking something that may not be true. So you have to be really careful with, with studying anything to do with Masonry and, and all this occultic, high-level Freemasonic crap. Just be really careful. That's my only advice. Yeah. But you know, this, this quote that I meant, um, that mm -hmm. Albert Pike wrote in this book about uh, that uh, Lucifer is God, doubt it not. Yeah, this that's the right. Essence. That, I think that you can find essence. that uh, document on archive.org, right, Yerk? Uh, Morals and Dogma, you can find it there. I don't know. I have it on my computer probably with the link to where I got it from. I don't care where I got it from, but it's... It's the complete book and it's in the PDF. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked it up on this page 201 when I was mm -hmm. reading about this Leo Texel mm -hmm. because Leo Texel also published a book, uh, La Bible Amusant, uh, The Amusing Bible, you know, mm -hmm. right. which of course is a total blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was interesting to getting into knowledge, into, into acquaintance with Leo Texel during the reading of this book Behind the Dictators. Oh, yeah, I remember which, that. Which I, yep. which mm -hmm. I still think is a wonderful book for everybody to yeah, study. Yeah, that is. Uh, that is. It's only about 100 pages long. It is out of print. It is uh, published in 1942 in the middle of World War II. And but it definitely absolutely more exposes. An, an advanced topic here. I think, uh, you know, early on when I was starting to learn about uh, Kabbalah and all that, uh, this stuff really confused me because I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's really not a straight, it's kind of a, you know, obscure topic, you know, when you're dealing with uh, Luciferians and all this. So, Yeah, sure. And everything that uh, deals with the deception of the Freemasons and the Jesuits mm -hmm. is, uh, is a very dangerous subject to have any kind of opinion on. You know, it's like the Dreyfus, it's, it's about the Dreyfus affair uh, when they nailed um, this uh, French colonel for treason uh, in, the, in the 1890s and sent them for years on Devil's Island and, uh, and, and, and it was all a hoax. Yeah? It, it was all not true. 
and even in even when that came out later, he didn't get a full pardon. I mean, uh, therefore you have to watch uh, the secret history of the Jesuits. Um, they also go deep into uh, the the, um, the Dreyfus affair that is also oh, mentioned yeah. behind the di mm -hmm. dictators. That is also mentioned behind the dictators, but it is also mentioned in uh, the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris, which I have read on my channel. Mm -hmm. um, and which I eventually will publish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I just oh, haven't rash. come to it. But I just, I just want to say when we read about these, uh, uh, this and this is stated there and there. This quote comes from there. This quote comes from there. Uh, sometimes it is very uh, important that you have to see which edition do you have. Mm -hmm. Like the author says here, there have been different editions of Morals and Dogma, and today it is even not uh, being handed out anymore to Masons, even of the 14th degree. Uh, and therefore it is very important that when you have an original copy, like you said, Brett, that you mm -hmm. saw one there in the library, yeah. if that was a really a, a, a original edition from the, from the 1870s, for example, mm -hmm. uh, when you have a, a, a Morals and Dogma in your hand that is from 1925, or 1962 or whatever uh, that will probably or can can of course be altered sure. and also and also because we have to remind ourselves that uh, as it says it is an esoteric book for scottish right use only to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient yeah so the the point is the point is who would dare to get that book out in the open yeah unedited unchanged you know yeah, uh, that's that's also something that everybody has to ask himself always because uh, you have a death penalty on when you're going to publish that book. Yeah. Are you really going to risk your life just to get that book out? I don't know. I think that these Masonic organizations are so very well organized in general that when they know that when someone dies who has had a copy of that book, that they will go to that house and will collect that oh, book sure. after his death. Yeah. 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 I'm quite sure of that. I mean, I, I can prove that. It's just an assumption. But when you know how these people work, I don't think that they, uh, I, I have no doubt that they have kind of a own secret police, you know, that uh, will do all these things. And therefore, we really have to be careful with, with these. And mm -hmm. to, to bring this little discussion to an end, um, we have read already about morals and dogma before, even though in the chapters before, and never ever P.D. Stewart makes this um, quote that Lucifer is uh, is God, he never publishes this here in his book. Mm -hmm. Up to now, I haven't seen it. Maybe it comes in the coming pages. I don't know. Then I swallow my words. But for the moment now, and this is a very important quote. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So when... When P.D. Stewart does not put it in there, that would actually give support to the understanding that this quote is a hoax, as I understood it from the reading of Behind the Dictators in the strange case of strange case of Leo Texel. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. anyway. You see, I yeah. also ran into some uh, altered books on the internet, and uh, now I'm getting some things in my head which are only partly. Uh, funny because uh, you know how uh, people are named who erase the truth are uh, the so-called man in black but yeah. uh, now now you you get get things started a little bit in my mind because uh, yeah government always uh, trying to erase the truth which uh, is too dangerous to know that's true Okay, so let's continue here. I'm, I'm sorry for this little explanation, but I think on the other hand, that was maybe interesting for some people to to hear and to see and how, again, this is one of the points, you know, Brett and Michael, connecting the dots, you know. Mm -hmm. You have one book, you have read one book here, you read one book there, and then all of a sudden you come to a subject that you say, oh, now I have to connect this dot with that dot, and I get a clearer picture. Well, certainly, of the yeah, this book is such a, I mean... Uh, to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient. Yeah, that's a pretty major statement. <laughs> Not one to mess around with, you know. That's for yeah. sure. And, um, well, it says, 
So the book has to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient. First and for all, I don't think that anybody who is uh, in the 14th degree and receives this book in any possibility to withdraw from that secret society. I mean, yeah. like they say, one CIA, always CIA, one's a Mason, always a Mason, because you swear a blood oath, you know? Right. And that blood oath is for the rest of your life. Yeah. But the death of the recipient, okay. But on the other hand, I know that it is uh, laid death penalty upon if you publish this book or if you give this book into hands that are not to have this book, which is everybody beneath the 14th degree of the Scottish Rite Masonry, as we read here. Okay, I'm going to continue. While writing this volume, I, and this is Peter Stewart, spoke to an ex-Mason, okay, question mark, <laughs> is there an ex-Mason, is there an ex-Jesuit, mm -hmm. and asked yeah. him whether he had read Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, and mentioned some of its contents to him. This ex-Mason looked at me with a very puzzled expression and said, that's news to me. He had not even so much as heard of the author. Albert Pike, notwithstanding that Pike was the Chief Inspector General Knight's Commander and Grand Pontiff of Masonry for many years. Grand Pontiff, isn't that an interesting title they give here? <laughs> the Bridge Builder? That's right. You have the Grand Pontiff of, mm -hmm. Knight of Freemasonry, and you have Ponti uh, Pontifex Maximus in the Roman yeah. Catholic Church, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are those connected by any chance? What do you think? <laughs> Grand Pontiff simply means high priest or chief priest. We must not forget that Freemasons described the Masonic Lodge as a temple. Pike was also an eminent American lawyer, a judge. The reason for this long introduction to the book will soon become apparent. Now, there are some Masons who will tell you that Albert Pike's work and statements have been discredited. However, David Overson wrote a book, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, The Masons and the Building of Washington, D.C. He published this book in 1999, which has a glowing forward written, for, uh, a glowing forward written by C. Fred Klein, Knecht, 33rd degree, Sovereign Grand Commander of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. Mother Council of the World. This is what the book has to say about Albert Pike. First, Albert Pike, probably the most learned esotericist in the United States of America, on page 31. Second, on page 92, quote, Albert Pike was a fine scholar in some areas, unquote. And on page 366, the learned Albert Pike. Now, Albert Pike. Masonry is the worship of Allah. The Shriner Masons, which are those Masons on the 32nd degree and above, kneel before the Quran and take his oath in the name of Allah. Do you doubt this? Masonic Grand Pontiff Albert Pike confirms this testimony. Quote, the Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in a Hebrew lodge and the Quran in a Mohammedan one belong on the altar. But one of these and the square and compass are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. Unquote. So according to the Grand Pontiff of Masonry, Albert Pike, the Bible, the Hebrew Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses, if you don't know that, and the Quran belong on the altar. But only one of these, along with the Masonic square and compass, are the great lights by which a mason, every mason means, this means, must walk and work. The question is, which one of these of the book by which the Masons walk and work. The following oath taken by every Shriner Mason offers us a clue. Quote, In willful violation thereof may I incur 
the fearful penalty of having my eyeballs pierced to the center with a three-edged blade, my feet flayed, and I be forced to walk the hot sands upon the sterile shores of the Red Sea until the flaming sun shall strike me with a livid plague, and may Allah, the God of Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers, support me to the entire fulfillment of the same. Amen. Amen. The Masonic Digest puts the issue beyond doubt. Quote, Masonry has nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing, nada, zip, zilch, to do with the Bible. It is founded upon the Bible, for if it were, it would not be Masonry, it would be something else. Ah, Yerk, you said it is founded, it is yeah. not Yeah, for founded. if it was, if it were. Right. Well, if it were, yeah, it is not founded upon the Bible. Did I say it was founded on the Bible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to quick correct you. <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. So masonry has nothing to do. N a t h n o t h i n g. Nothing. Zip. Zitch. Zero. Nada. Nichts. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to do with the Bible, it is not n o t founded upon the Bible. For if it were, it would not be masonry. It would be something else. Emphasize supplied by P.D. Stewart and Jörg Glissmann during the reading. <laughs> and C.F. McQuake adds his weight in gold. Quote, Freemasonry is not Christian, nor a substitute for it. Unquote. Thanks, Brad. You're Sometimes welcome. I'm not a problem. Little, but I think that from the context, it was understood what I meant. <laughs> well, I can only imagine if I was reading this, how many corrections I would have to have. So. Yeah, my, my eyes are not the best today. I don't know what's, uh, I, I have difficulties reading this today. I, I don't know why. Anyway, what would it be if it were founded on the Bible? Christianity. So... What then is it, since it is not founded upon the Bible? <laughs> How about anti-Christianity? Yeah. How about anti-Christian? <laughs> there we go. You know, that's interesting you bring that up, Yerk, because uh, you know this, uh, this video that uh, Press for Truth put out a couple few years back on the 33rd degree Freemasonic Temple there in Washington, D.C.? These fellows from Canada came down to the United States there in Washington, D.C. and filmed that. And they did an excellent job. And uh, I think it was uh, my old friend there, um, Ulrich Wiley, who posted it up on his uh, Google+. Plus. And I made a comment on that video that uh, this, is, this is an Antichrist temple. And the only reason I pointed that out is because on this chair sitting outside the lodge or the the that grand room, whatever you call it, the temple there, there's this chair sitting out there that says, know thyself, quote unquote. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what blasphemy. Jesus said, deny thyself, pick up your yeah. cross and follow me. And I was thinking, you know, this is the biggest blasphemy I've ever seen. You know, this is totally anti-Christ temple. And I made a comment like that and they deleted it. You know, I think that they were getting a lot of Masons coming in there. And um, they didn't and like know, that. Know comment. thyself, Brett. Know thyself, Brett, is just a uh, another way to speak about Gnosticism. Sure. You bet. Mm-hmm. Right. And all of uh, Freemasonry is built on Gnosticism, of course. Yeah? Right. It's all about me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all about the knowledge of men, and it has nothing yeah. to do with the wisdom of God. It's bullshit. Yeah. Pardon my yeah, French. It's BS, yeah. <laughs> it's BS, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Is. Now, according to Shaw and McKenney, quote, <clears throat> sorry, every Shriner kneeling before the Quran takes his oath in the name of Allah and acknowledges his, this pagan god of vengeance as his own, the god of our fathers. And in the rituals, he 
acknowledges Islam, the declared blood enemy of Christianity, as the one true path. Unquote. Moreover, the Masonic square and compass are phallic symbols of the male and female genitalia, the veneration and the worship of the sex organs. These, along with the Quran, the square and compass, properly understood, are the lights by which a mason must walk and work. You know, this gives a little bit explanation of where Freemasonry actually comes from. Mm. And when we, when we trace it back to the, its absolutely beginnings, mm. Freemasonry comes from Babylon. And why does it come from Babylon? Because God looked down from heaven on the earth and, saw, and said, people are becoming one. Now we have to go down and destroy that tower so that they are not becoming one. And God came down from heaven and destroyed the tower and confused the people by inventing, quote-unquote, the different uh, languages we speak today. Right. That's how the nations were founded. Yep. yep. So, but they always wanted to have, they wanted to be one. They wanted to have, like the New World Order today, one religion, one king, one economy. Everything was the same as with this quote-unquote New World Order today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they also wanted to have one language. And the one language that they kept was the language of symbols and symbolism. And that is working from the time of Babylon on still until today. And these symbols are still valid today for those people who know these symbols and know what they mean and can read them. The that is their, That's right. Yeah, that is, that is their world language. When we profane people speak of English as the world language today, because with English you can probably get in 90% of the, of the countries of this world a little bit uh, uh, conversation. Uh, you can get everywhere. Mm -hmm. Their worldwide language is the symbolism. And of course, that symbolism adapted throughout the years also. But, you know, anybody who says to me, but Jörg, you are wrong, Freemasons, uh, Freemasons were only founded here by the Knights Templars or were founded by the Jesuits and all that stuff. So then why does it say in the Bible that the builders rejected the cornerstone? Who, who are the builders there in the Bible? To me, this is a very firm affirmation of Freemasons existing mm. at the time of Jesus Christ and even before. Sure. Yeah, good point, Eric. Yeah. Very good point. And they are communicating through their symbolism. And of course, we cannot understand this. We people who are not initiated in that, we cannot understand that symbolism. And I think it is good also. We don't need to understand that. What we need to understand in the very first place is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to study the Bible. In Acts, it is said, and they studied the Bible daily to see if these things were so. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the Bereans. Mm -hmm. And we all should try to be good Bereans in the very first place. Bible-believing Christians. Mm -hmm. And leave the symbolism and all this esoteric knowledge to the people who want to keep themselves busy with this. I think that this, how deeper, the, the, the deeper you go into this esoteric knowledge and study it, I think the more is the danger that you are being infected with it, like when you get the flu. Right. Or some, or some other quote-unquote virus that does not exist. There are no viruses, but that's another case. Well, certainly mm, but, if you put more emphasis on, on the symbolism than you do on the Bible, then you, you're losing it for sure. It, Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and the Bible also is full of symbolism in that way mm -hmm. that the Bible speaks in parables. The Bible speaks in prophecies where things have to be taken spiritually and they cannot be transported from that spiritual meaning into a 100% um, fleshly meaning, material meaning, civil meaning that we have here, worldly meaning. You know, this is why a worldly mind can never understand the spiritual meaning of the Bible. Yeah. 
but the Bible also speaks in quote unquote symbols, not 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 compared to not the same symbols of Freemasonry. Of course, don't understand me wrong. I'm not saying anything bad about the Bible, but you can only understand the Bible when you have the spiritual guidance through the Holy Spirit that he will lead you into all truths and show you that these spiritual words have an actual meaning that you don't understand when you just glance over it. When you read the Bible like Moby Dick, you will never get what it's about. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's the point that I want to make. Right. Now, yeah. we, are, we are here in this world and we are seeing the symbols from the Freemasons like Moby Dick symbols. You know, that's the point that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. We don't understand these symbols because we are not initiated. And I, I don't think that we need to understand their symbolism. We yep. need to understand the symbolism of God in the Bible. That yeah. is most important because that saves us. And this other stuff will only condemn us. Mm -hmm. Yes. You see, Jörg, um, speaking of symbols, in uh, <clears throat> in the Morals and Dogma book on uh, page 292, there are many symbols uh, explained. And also I can back up that uh, I need the Bible desperately as a counterweight, uh, as I'm used to get so much uh, information uh, out of this uh, code with Babylon that uh, I do need the Bible Uh, every day to have the balance to get the balance back yeah that's about the point that i wanted to make yeah yeah, yeah. i can back that yeah me too yep bible is very important it's the uh, the basis of our the foundation of our faith absolutely yeah uh, you, you know that's the truth you see and mm -hmm. speaking speaking of the truth the truth will set you free Because I I like to have the truth, and uh, only if I I have the truth, I can uh, I can recognize uh, the false doctrine, and I can recognize. That's, it. Uh, That's just uh, it. You know, you just nailed it there, mm -hmm. Michael. Yeah, because, you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can only understand the lie when you know the truth. Yeah. yeah. You can only only tell a forged one dollar note from a correct one dollar note when you have mm -hmm. the original in your hands. I yeah. mean, they are all forgeries. Even the original dollar note is a forgery because it's a federal note. But that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, mm. only when you have the original in your hand to compare with, you can see what the falsified, what the falsified uh, uh, subject is. That's the problem in our world today. We are so bombarded with lies from cradle to grave that we never see the true light if God, not in his grace, uh, takes us to his son. Yeah, that's the sad thing, Yerk, about this world is that I think that sadly that uh, many do not realize how incredibly vital it is to have a, 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 a how do you say this, a, a Bible that is not corrupted. I mean, we would be in such big trouble without it. Mm -hmm. And... That's one of my main reasons for not wanting to even think about going to a local church or anything is because they don't even recognize a 1611 King James. Hardly anyone does. And they think you're nuts for even bringing it up. And yeah, that's, because I, that's sad. That's really sad. But that gives you an idea of, you know, that's where I'm at. I'm just not even interested. In, in having a discussion with anyone anymore unless they're using a 1611 King James. I absolutely agree. Yeah, that's the, pro that's the point. Because I just want to avoid mix. them like the plague because that's what it is. It's a plague. Yeah, we cannot mix the holy with the profane. Bread. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Then you're asking for trouble. Uh, you see, they, they got uh, almost 2,000 years Mm. to make make false statements and uh, so i think it's a, it's kind of I, i hope it's it's a correct english uh, phrase it's a kind of salami tactics mm -hmm. yeah you see it's a uh, bit by bit by bit uh, false information and people get used to it because it's so long it happened so long a time ago right right and 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 also the uh, these uh, different Bibles, uh, 
people are not interested anymore in, in, in books as there were some centuries ago. And so it's very hard to convince uh, anyone because uh, they relate on the television on, and on so-called modern media. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, right, right. It's, 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 it's so strange, but uh, you see that in, in, in quote, old book, unquote, um, has uh, the most profound meaning and the truth. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine for, for the general public because they are not used to use books anymore. That that in that uh, that way, that they were used uh, on on our grandfathers and and so, <clears throat> and that's a uh, quite shame because you see that uh, the book always intends you to have a relationship between the the words and uh, the receiver. That's and, right. Uh, that's right. To have a, a clear picture of what you're what you're trying to comprehend and what you know that the doctrine really mm -hmm. is is so vital. To yeah. having a, 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 a clear conscience with our Lord, I guess is what I want to say. Yeah, and also you can you can uh, repeat sentences, you can look it up, and so and on the other hand, with the modern media, you get bombarded with information mm -hmm. and and one thing after the other, uh, the next, and and so and so and so and and so it it just confuses people instead of uh, giving a clear picture, and that's what I like so much. Uh, uh, in books, because you see, you can you can look it up, you can look it up, and you can repeat sentences, and and so you get an interaction. And uh, if it's something's not understand, uh, you, you don't understand an, any sentence. You can look it up again. Yeah, and, you can uh, slow down and really think it out. Yes, you can mm -hmm. slow down, and and so that's that's, uh, really that's the important. thing. Yeah, that's the thing with the books, because right. you see, it's 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 a it's a shame. Uh, that people are not into books anymore that much. You see, there are so many copies around. Also on Code with Babylon, imagine um, uh, that you can uh, buy uh, used books. So you see, there are people out there who are interesting interested in that matter. It's a, it's a very specific matter, of course. But then again, they 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 put it back or. They refuse to read it, or what? 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 What else? Or they get get it as a present, and they can't ab appreciate it. So it's 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 very hard for me. I wouldn't. Uh, I would uh, like to. Um, I, I see this these books as a pressure, uh, precious uh, s something. You see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can I cannot uh, get used to to the idea that I will uh, throw it away or something because it's a it's a very interesting and profound knowledge, and mm -hmm. people cannot appreciate this knowledge because you see, uh, two days ago I ran into a, a person and I, and 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 I told her okay you really want to know about this you want to yeah yeah I do you want to you okay and I started a two or three sentence and then I asked again okay do you really want the truth. Uh, oh no, better not. <laughs> so, so um, it's 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 hard because most people mm -hmm. um, would not cannot handle the truth. I think because they know they they have not the foundation of the faith. Yeah, that already is written in the Bible, Michael. I don't know the exact mm -hmm. place, but it's somewhere in the mm -hmm. New Testament that uh, they uh, they don't want to receive the truth, and they they have more pleasure in uh, doing sin. Than accepting the truth and uh, and showing them the tr the mm. truth. Um, by the way, since uh, you guys were discussing this, I looked it up in uh, my copy of Morals and Dogma on page two hundred and ten, and this is the um, this is the uh, the quote from Albert Pike that is wrongly quoted all over the internet, okay. because it reads here: the apocalypse is to those who receive the nineteenth degree the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pumps and works of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light and with its splendors, intolerable blinds, feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. And this quote is forgerized all over the internet to 
to say that Lucifer is God. Where mm. here it says the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light and then and, and all this? But it does not say that he is the, the God of uh, Freemasonry. So I just looked that up and I think that this is time for us to come to a conclusion of the broadcast today and continue another time in Sounds this uh, chapter 41. Albert Pike Masonry is the worship of Lucifer. Interesting, huh? It yeah, was- that, that's a really good point. You bring that up, Yerk. Actually, about that. Yeah, and anybody who wants well, uh, a little bit deeper explanation of that, uh, go to my reading of uh, the book um, Behind the Dictators, that is on my channel, Journal 66, and also on Brett's channel, Brett Norman's channel to be mm-hmm. found. Um, I think it is the third or fourth chapter, The Strange Case of Leo Texel, and uh, there I go into that. Right. Okay. I thank Michael for his visit, and I thank you, Brett, for the invitation. And I, for myself, will say for this moment, thanks for the attention and uh, for the comments. And I hope you enjoyed reading along with us and understanding along with us how deceptive Freemasonry is and what kind of a big trap it is and how dangerous Freemasonry is and how easy it is to fall into that trap. So now ye have been warned. Mm-hmm. Until next time, Maranatha. Goodbye, everybody. Yes, thanks for having me and uh, goodbye. That for the first time in human history, For the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict, of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,000, years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order, which was established after World War II. 70 years 
based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history. And I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.